Hello there and welcome to the Creatures of London virtual tour. Uh, I'm going to lead you around uh, uh, virtually around Westminster uh, and we'll talk about how our furred and feathered friends featured throughout London's history and still feature in London's uh, present day. My name's Rebecca. Um, I've been a tour guide in London since 2006 and a virtual tour guide since 2020, uh, since it happened to the best of us. Now we're going to start out uh, with the map there, that's the area we're going to go. Um, so we're going to, if you follow that orange line, sorry, my hand-drawn map here, I'm not an artist and this is not to scale. Uh, we're going to go around the area of Westminster, finishing at the Animals in War Memorial. If you do live in central London, you could make this a real walking tour or you could use Google Street View, um, I suppose. Uh, but we're going to keep going. We're going to start at Trafalgar Square. Uh, we're going to start in Trafalgar Square with perhaps the most famous animal statues in London, uh, the Trafalgar Square Lions, also known as the Landseer Lions. Uh, they were commissioned by a sculptor called Edwin Landseer in the mid-19th century uh, to be part of Trafalgar Square, flanking Nelson's column uh, in the mid nineteenth when the square was laid out. Tour guides, and I include myself in this absolutely 100%, uh, tour guides are fond of saying um, that the lions in Trafalgar Square look nothing like lions because Edwin Landseer, the sculptor, had never seen a real lion before. And we often say it with a silly old Landseer kind of vibe. Um, and I've been guilty of it because, well, you know, you've got 100 people and you're hurrying off to change the guard. You don't really have time to tell the whole truth and nothing but the truth. We can do that here today because it's virtual. We're not rushing off anywhere. Um, so it is true that the lions don't look like lions. Their back legs aren't right. Their, their mane isn't right. The front paws aren't right. They don't frown. Real lions don't frown like that. Um, but it's not because of Lancia's lack of knowledge of a lion. Now, when he was commissioned to create these statues, um, he was known for animal paintings, mostly dogs uh, and uh, native UK wildlife. He'd never painted or uh, sculpted a lion before, um, but had probably seen them. There were a lot of menageries around London by then. London Zoo had opened uh, by then. Uh, the first lions had arrived at a London menagerie in the 13th century, and there'd been lions in London menageries ever since. So Lancet probably had seen a lion, but uh, what is more accurate to say is he probably he hadn't observed a lion closely enough to paint it or sculpt it which for artists is a very different thing. Just having a look at one, having a quick, we say in London, butcher's hook, look, uh, is much different to observing one closely enough to, to recreate it. And Lancey hadn't done that yet, so he set about it. Uh, he went down to London Zoo. He became a regular at London Zoo for literally years, getting to know their lines. And you can see some of the sketches he did here. Uh, he spent years at London Zoo sketching the lions. Uh, and you can see that he knew the anatomy of a lion quite well by the end of that. Uh, he knew that a lion didn't lay on its belly. Uh, he knew that the manes were a bit unkempt, not, not styled like this. Uh, and, and he knew that what their front paws looked like. Um, so basically it was an artistic choice. Landseer had been commissioned to create four virtually identical lion statues to sit around Nelson's column. And he thought it would just look better if they were on their bellies. Um, and he thought that it would look better if the paws were a little neater and all these sorts of things. So he made artistic choices, knowing full well that it wasn't an accurate depiction of a line, because that's not what he'd been commissioned to do. Uh, so he's in his studio, he's, he's wanting to make the lions sitting up. He knows lions don't lay like that, so there's no point going down to London Zoo to do another sketch. So he used his dogs as models. That's a self-portrait uh, of Landseer, uh, with his dogs looking rather menacingly over his shoulder there. His dogs went everywhere with him. He loved his dogs. Uh, and it was a collie dog, apparently, um, that he used to create the back legs uh, of the lion that he used as a model. Uh, so Lancia knew full well what he was doing. He knew he was creating a lion statue that didn't look much, wasn't anatomically correct. Uh, but frankly, the press were making so much fun of him because he'd been taking so long over it. The rest of Trafalgar Square was finished. The column was finished. Trafalgar Square was finished. And Lancia was still sitting in London Zoo sketching lions. So he was being made enough fun of by the press for doing that, that being made fun of because it didn't look like a lion very much was the least of his woes. Now we're going to move on, but stay in Trafalgar Square to meet this young lady here. This is uh, Harris Hawke. 
And the, the, I, I didn't get to know the hawk personally enough when I took this photo to know whether it was a male or a female, um, but I'm reliably informed that um, handlers, hawkers, always refer to the bird as she, regardless of its actual gender. So she is responsible for keeping Trafalgar Square clear of pigeons. Um, there used to be loads of pigeons in Trafalgar Square. I mean, it was a thing. They were everywhere. Um, most London children, uh, well, uh, most London children over the age of about 30 uh, would probably have the memory of going to Trafalgar Square to feed the pigeons. Uh, and, the, and your older sibling throwing bird seed at you. And it's, it's like that scene in, in that Alfred Hitchcock movie and then it, it haunts your nightmares until the present day. No, I'm kidding, of course. I do remember feeding the pigeons in Trafalgar Square. My older brother didn't do anything like that. Um, and the pigeons were, the pigeons were, um, I'm trying to phrase this delicately. The square needed to be cleaned a lot because of what the pigeons left behind. The pigeons leavings, there we go, that's the nicer word. Um, and the square was um, a, an important heritage site and, and it was damaging the square. The pigeon, not the pigeons themselves, but the frequent cleaning that was needed uh, was damaging the square. So they decided that the, the pigeons needed to be moved on. So in 2005, from 2005, uh, the Harris Hawks have been brought in every morning to just scare the pigeons away. They don't recreate any nasty David Attenborough movies, films. Um, so very few pigeons in Trafalgar Square. You can see in the background of the photograph on the left there, she's done her job. Now we're going to continue down Whitehall. Just south of Trafalgar Square is a road called Great Scotland Yard, where this building uh, is. You may guess from the photo I've chosen to accompany it who lives, who would live in a house like this? Well, the police horses. Uh, the mounted division of the Metropolitan Police have their stables here on Great Scotland Yard. And of course, um, Great Scotland Yard is where the Metropolitan Police was established in the 19th century. The very first Metropolitan Police headquarters was on Great Scotland Yard on that road. It's moved several times since then, but its original address is why we've called every subsequent police headquarters Scotland Yard, um, because this is the street um, that it was on. The building is long gone, but the stables are still here on Great Scotland Yard. Uh, and the police horses are used for um, crowd control, footballs, protests, um, and football matches and protests. Uh, they're used for you, this horse and rider here are accompanying changing of the guard, uh, Buckingham Palace. They're, they're just waiting for the soldiers to come down the mall so they can stop the cars and uh, let the soldiers into Buckingham Palace. Uh, and they're used for many other events uh, as well. At the stables on Great Scotland Yard, there's generally 15 to 20 horses. Uh, in residence. And any horse uh, lovers may be thinking, doesn't look big enough. It's a very unusual stables because there are stables on two floors. So there's an upper floor and a lower floor uh, for the horses. I'm told that's very unusual. The horses, uh, so the horses go upstairs to the, I mean, they don't, go, they don't go upstairs, they go up a ramp to the upper floor. Uh, and there's a very um, uh, important resident at Great Scotland Yard, so important that he's named on the evacuation notice. So just inside the door here, um, I, I wish I'd got a photo of it, but you're just gonna have to trust me. So just inside the door, there's a list of all the animals who are in Scotland Yard um, at any one time. So the humans sign themselves in and out, they can do that. Uh, but the, uh, just inside the door, there's a list of how many horses are on each level. So they don't name the horses because they, they're moved around a lot. So it's just how many horses on the upper floor, how many horses on the lower floor. Uh, and then one animal is named, uh, which is Henry the Stable Cat, uh, has his uh, name there. He's responsible for keeping all the mice down. And Henry is actually a Battersea rescue. Henry was um, acquired by the police from Battersea Dogs and Cats Home. Um, so he's, uh, uh, I'm sure, would be very grateful um, if you could donate to Battersea Dog Dogs and Cats Home uh, via my Just Giving page, which I'll put the link at the end. And we've got the police horses in action again. There they are at Trooping the Colour. Um, so here they are on the mall. The, the royal family and the soldiers have all been down the mall uh, and they're just opening the mall, letting the public uh, come down behind them. I just want to tell one quick story. Um, I, I was going to not tell this story because uh, for the sake of time, I'll, I'll try to make it quick. So the police horses and the British Army horses, who we're going to meet in a moment, the Household Cavalry, uh, often share 
resources. Um, so, so they often use the same veterinary schools and they often use the same stables, often each other's, but so they'll share them in London anyway. And there was an occasion in the 1980s, there was an incident when, when a police horse and an army horse were both injured and were both recovering at the same veterinary uh, school, I think both at the army veterinary school of memory serves. Uh, the army horse recovered fully, went back to his duties, everything was fine. Uh, the police force recovered physically, but was never able to go back to work. Um, so he was retired early and went off to a retirement farm. Um, that's not a euphemism, he generally, he generally went to a stable that takes retired working horses. Uh, years later, many years later, the army horse retired as well in due course, and quite by coincidence went to the same stables. Uh, as the police horse and apparently they remembered one another. The first thing the army horse did, he was led onto the yard and the first thing he did was scuttle over to the police horse who he'd made friends with all those years ago and hadn't seen since. Uh, hey, it's my chum, hi. I just think that's a cute story, that's all. Um, the two horses remembered one another. And they do work and live quite closely to one another. Um, you can see, so here's horse guard, household cavalry, and there's Great Scotland Yard, almost opposite. So the two stables are very close. And they see each other a lot at Trooping the Colour and changing the guard every morning. Um, but we're going to talk about the horse guards now, or rather the household cavalry at horse guards. The building they're standing in front of is horse guards, the ceremonial entrance to Buckingham and St. James Palaces. The horses and soldiers are the household cavalry. So the soldiers in real life are an armoured reconnaissance regiment. Uh, the horses are here for the ceremonial part of their duties, guarding the palaces. Uh, the horses are, uh, are bred to be very, very calm, very chilled, uh, particularly when it comes to noise. So the horses are, are, there's buses and taxis and noisy vehicles and crowds of tourists going right in front of them uh, when they're on horse guards. Uh, so they're bred to be very calm, very chilled out. Uh, the, the, the breed is an Irish black or cavalry black. They mostly come from Ireland. They're recruited by the British Army when they're three or four years old, trained by the British Army, uh, and they generally retire when they, when they want, usually about 17 years old, but some of the horses carry on into their 20s. And apparently they are spoiled rotten by the soldiers. There was one horse named Thomas, who the soldiers had taught how to kiss people. Um, it, it, was a, it wasn't very long ago, it was about 20 years ago, and it was a common sight uh, or sound for tour guides to hear someone screaming because Thomas had just kissed them uh, 20 years ago, 10 years ago, rather. Uh, he even snogged Philip Schofield at the Golden Jubilee in 2012. Good old Thomas. Thomas has gone into retirement now. Uh, and the horses, by the way, again, for any horse lovers who are thinking those poor horses standing there for ages, each horse only does one hour uh, on guard on Whitehall and they're only uh, on duty for 24 hours at a time. They swap the horses every 24 hours, including Christmas Day. Um, so the horses are well looked after and they do things like tripping the colour. Here they are. So tripping the colour is the Queen's birthday parade. <coughs> Excuse me. The Queen's birthday parade. So our monarchs have two birthdays. They have the day that the anniversary of their birth, which is usually marked privately, and then a big public celebration in June uh, when the police horses, uh, the police horses, sorry, I've got police horses in the brain now, the army horses uh, and, and a lot of humans are. Uh, it's a military parade. So there's about uh, many, many soldiers and 400 horses take part, including the Irish Blacks, the Cavalry Blacks uh, and the Shire horses there uh, and the Windsor Greys and Cleveland Bays who pull the royal carriages, which I don't have a picture of them. And also um, at Trooping the Colour, occasionally we have a dog. Uh, this is the mascot of the Irish Guards. So the Irish Guards are in the red coats and the big fuzzy hats. They're one of the regiments that guard Buckingham Palace. And they're the only one of th those regiments uh, to still have an animal mascot, an Irish wolfhound. Um, animal mascots used, used to be much more common in the British Army, but they're not so common now. Um, this is Donald uh, at Trooping the Colour a few years ago, proudly leading his regiment down the mall and having the best walkies of his life. Look at all those people who are cheering him on on his walkies. Um, the Donald actually retired last year. The, the Irish Guards mascot now is called Turlock Moor. And I don't have a photo of him because he's not done any ceremonial occasions yet. Um, but I'm sure he will perform beautifully. Um, right, let's carry on. So we're going down Whitehall to Downing Street now. 
and so here we are at Downing Street. Uh, Downing Street, this is the, the black gates on Whitehall. Uh, if you're lucky enough to get through those gates, uh, here's 10 Downing Street, the home of every Prime Minister since the 1700s. But we're not here to talk about Prime Ministers, we're here to talk about Larry the Cat. Here's Larry. Uh, Larry the Cat is, um, uh, well, he has a job title. He's actually uh, uh, employed at number 10, the most important resident and perhaps the most important employee at number 10 Downing Street. Uh, his job title is uh, very cumbersome for such a little cat. It's Her Majesty's Chief Mouser to the Cabinet Office. And so it's his job to keep the mice down. Uh, he and the other um, government mousers. There are, the, the, the buildings around Whitehall seem to have been plagued with mice problems for centuries. There have been mousers uh, for centuries in, in the government buildings. Uh, we, we know them all now because Larry keeps getting in fights with them. Uh, and he keeps being splashed all over the newspapers because he fights with the other mouses. Uh, but I, I mean, even when this area was Whitehall Palace, Henry VIII employed cats as mouses uh, when it was a royal palace. So there, there just seems to have been a historically a mouse problem uh, at this site. I don't know, I can't explain why. Well, I have a theory and there's, there's always been rumors of tunnels underneath Whitehall, um, either connecting royal palaces when it was a palace or connecting government buildings now. So maybe they're true, then that's what all the mice live. Uh, Larry has been in the position of Chief Mouser since 2011, and it's a job for life if he wants it. It's the most stable job in government. You can see here Larry waiting at the door of number 10. Uh, this just in from the Ministry of Random Information. Uh, the door of number 10 Downing Street only opens from the inside. So there's a person whose job it is to open the door of 10 Downing Street for humans, but also, of course, more importantly, for Larry. Now let's carry on. Uh, we're going down to Parliament Square here, so the Parliament Square at the end of Whitehall, uh, home to the Houses of Parliament, also known as the Palace of Westminster. And um, there it is in all its glory with Big Ben or the Elizabeth Tower, if you prefer. I, I, I'm not going to be pedantic. Uh, the Houses of Parliament is where our um, government uh, uh, work and uh, make bills and debate and pass laws. Um, the Bit we're going to talk about specifically is the House of Commons, which is this end, the Big Ben end of the building, as the House of Commons. It's where our democratically elected ministers of parliament uh, debate and vote. Uh, so the opposition on one side, the government on the other side. Uh, the, the front benches of the government and opposition are carefully two sword lengths apart, because you can't be too careful. Uh, but we're going to talk about an occasion in the 1870s uh, when a debate was suspended and the House of Commons was evacuated because of a cat. That is not the cat from the 1870s. Nobody thought to take a photo of the cat that broke into the House of Commons because there's no Instagram, what's the point? And um, this is my mother's cat, Daniel, uh, standing in. So the cat somehow got into the House of Commons. Nobody's clear on how it got in. Um, the House of, it got into the House of Commons during a debate and started leaping all over the benches and leaping all over the MPs. Uh, they tried to chase the cat out and it, it, they couldn't catch it. It wouldn't be chased out. It was probably busy knocking things off shelves, as cats do. Um, and there was such a chaotic um, atmosphere because of this cat um, that the Speaker of the House of Commons finally said, right, OK, this is ridiculous. I am suspending this debate. I'm stopping this debate and I'm, I'm all of you get out. Uh, he chucked all the MPs out while they got the cat um, out and then they could resume what they were doing. And um, so a cat got the MPs in such a flap. Uh, it was no debate of any great national importance, but uh, uh, nevertheless, they were chucked out because uh, the cat had caused too much of a kerfuffle. About 100 years before that, in the 1700s, a dog uh, got into the House of Commons. Again, this is not the dog. Uh, this is my friend's dog, Bodger, who's standing in because nobody got thought to get a sketch of the dog in the 1700s. Uh, a dog got into the House of Commons and started barking um, and running around. Uh, the dog seems to have been easier to get rid of. They didn't have to suspend the debate. Uh, they managed to shoo the dog out. Thank you very much, doggy. Off you go. Uh, and the politician who'd been talking at the time was the Prime Minister, Lord North. And once the dog was out of the House of Commons, he said, brace yourself, an hilarious 18th century joke. Uh, Lord North stood up and said, as I was saying before I was interrupted by the MP for Berkshire. Do you see? Berkshire, oh, that Lord North, what a crack up. And a hundred years before that, in the 1600s, a crow got into the House of Commons. I don't know the crow personally. A crow in Hyde Park is the best I can do you. 
let's call him Reg. Um, Crowe got into the House of Commons and just sat there quietly and watched the debate it may have changed the course of parliamentary history. Um, at the time, the MPs were debating uh, a bill on legal costs, nothing terribly groundbreaking. Uh, and Miss Crowe got into the House of Commons and just sat there quietly watching. And in the 1600s, um, people were very superstitious about crows. And none of the MPs said this is why, but up until the point the crow turned up in the House of Commons, they'd all been supporting this bill on legal costs. The crow turned up and suddenly they all voted against it. Nobody said why, but the, the, the theory is that either subconsciously or consciously, they thought, saw this crow, thought it was an ill omen, which is what a crow was considered to be, and thought they should change their minds and vote against the bill. Um, so we don't know. So thank you to Daniel, Bodger and Reg. Now we're staying in Parliament Square, but going over the road to Westminster Abbey. Uh, Westminster Abbey is a glorious medieval uh, church. It's um, been there for about a thousand years, though most of the building is about 700 years old. And there are about three, there are over, well over 3,000 people either buried or cremated in the building, including Charles Darwin, Charles Dickens, Geoffrey Chaucer, uh, Isaac Newton, the ashes of Stephen Hawking, we've got kings, queens, authors, poets, scientists, prime ministers, politicians, everyone, uh, buried within Westminster Abbey. Uh, this is an old postcard of the interior of Westminster Abbey, looking fabulous. Uh, and this lady is buried there. This is Frances Stewart, who is buried inside Westminster Abbey. Frances Stewart, Duchess of Richmond, uh, was one of the many mistresses of King Charles II. Um, King Charles II did have a lot of girlfriends as well as his wife, and Francis Stuart was one of them. Francis Stuart was also the model for Britannia, which is looking vaguely familiar. If you look at an old English coin, um, that's, that's Francis Stuart. She was the first model of Britannia. Um, and she had a good friend who lived with her for 40 years, no, not King Charles II, a grey parrot. Uh, up on the right hand side there, just in the corner, that's the African grey parrot. Um, that lived with Francis Stuart for about 40 years. They, they were devoted to one another. Um, and Francis Stuart said she didn't want to be separated from the parrot even in death. Uh, and so she put it in her will that she wanted the parrot buried with her. She wanted to be buried with the parrot. Uh, now Francis Stuart died in 1702 uh, and was buried at Westminster Abbey. The parrot died a few months later, um, but digging up a tomb in Westminster Abbey is not a simple affair. Uh, so the Abbey decided, uh, the Dean at Westminster Abbey decided instead that they would stuff the bird, with Francis Stuart's family's permission, that they would stuff the bird and keep it with her wax effigy. So this is, this is what that is in the uh, Abbey Museum. So the reason she looks a bit wooden there is because she's a bit wooden, that's her wax effigy. And the stuffed bird in the corner there with her. Her family agreed that Francis Stuart would have liked that. Uh, and it's thought that that bird is the oldest stuffed bird in the world. Uh, Francis Stewart's African Grey. Now just over the road from Westminster Abbey is Methodist Central Hall uh, where in the 1960s there was an exhibition about the World Cup uh, featuring the Jules Romay trophy which you can see Bobby Moore manhandling there after England won it. Very popular exhibition England had just won the World Cup. Uh, everyone flocked there to see the uh, Jules Romay trophy that is until one night when it was stolen. Uh, thieves broke into the Methodist Central Hall and stole the World Cup. Um, they, they may not have been the smartest thieves in existence. They, they stole the World Cup and ignored a case of the case next to it, which was stamps worth three million pound. Experts at the time said they couldn't have got more than 30,000 for the George Romero trophy. And their hiding place wasn't brilliant either. Uh, they hid the Jules Romay trophy very carefully in a park, or rather not so carefully, because it was discovered by Pickles the dog on his morning walk. And Pickles the dog uh, found the World Cup while he was on his morning walk in Beulah Hill in South London. Uh, he started snuffling around in the undergrowth and his owner went to see and he wasn't, he found the World Cup. Uh, so Pickles the dog became a celebrity. Uh, briefly in the 1960s. You can see he got a, a medal there for finding the World Cup uh, and he was also um, the subject of a TV comedy called The Spy with the Spy with the Cold Nose, which he was featured in a couple of times. Uh, so Pickles the dog, a hero to football fans everywhere. Well done Pickles, good boy. 
Uh, St James's Park we're going to next year, you can see St James's Park, uh, a glorious park, one of my favourites in, in central London, it's an oasis of calm and beautiful uh, flora and fauna, and it's home to these chaps and chapesses, uh, the pelicans of St James's Park. Uh, there have been pelicans in St James's Park since the 1600s, obviously these two are not quite that old. Uh, the first pelicans were a gift to King Charles II from the Russian ambassador. And there have been pelicans in the park ever since. Although we've never really had the pitter patter of tiny pelican feet. Uh, I, I'm told by a wildlife documentary that I once saw uh, that pelicans like to breed when there's a big flock. They only like to breed when there's a big flock. And we've never had that many of them in St. James Park Lake. Uh, at the moment, there's five or six. So there's never very many of them, so they don't breed. So there's never very many of them, so they don't breed. Uh, kind of a circular thing. We still have pelicans because, they're, I mean, they're not native to the UK. Pelicans are not native to the UK. Uh, so they've been donated to us over the, over the years, over the centuries. Uh, a, a few years ago, Prague Zoo um, donated a few pelicans, uh, three pelicans. Um, one of the pelicans in St. James Park at the moment is um, a pelican who was discovered in south, on the south coast of England. Uh, he was, he'd been injured, um, presumably he'd been blown off course by a storm, and he was brought to St. James Park to recuperate and just never left. Probably because the wildlife manager feeds the pelicans every day at 2.30, so why would you leave? A man comes and feeds you every day. I mean, the wings aren't clipped, they can go. You could go whenever you wanted to, but uh, uh, a man feeds him. Why go? And he, he, they're, 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 they're very, very bold. I mean, look how close they are to humans here. They, they, they own St. James Park and they know it. They are the residents of St. James Park. Uh, but St. James Park is glorious, there it is again. And it is the wildlife manager at St. James Park actively, and all the other people, royal parks, actively encourage wildlife. And um, so in St. James's Park, um, there are geese and ducks, there are swans and cygnets, the uh, gray heron there, uh, the squirrels, the gray squirrels are everywhere. The gray squirrels, which will mug you for your sandwiches, they're very bold as well. And the green parakeets and owls and bats and foxes and creepy crawlies and all sorts of other things as well. Uh, the green parakeets are rather bold as well, as you can see from that photo. Um, the, the green parakeets also not native uh, to the UK. They're a tropical species. Uh, how on earth have we got them in central London? There's a huge population of green parakeets now across the southeast of England and in London. In central, we're right in central London here. Um, it, it's thought, where on earth did they come from? It's thought that, and um, there's there's some stories. One is that they are all the parakeets are descended from a breeding pair that Jimi Hendrix released in the 1960s, uh, or they're from a group of birds that escaped from when they were filming the movie The African Queen in West London, at a studio in West London, uh, or they're just various animals that escape from private collections. Uh, we'll probably never know the truth. I'd love to believe they're the birds of Jimi Hendrix, uh, uh, sort of the generations on still hanging out in London, that would be cool. Now let's carry on. We're gonna go on to the mail here, uh, which runs alongside St. James's Park uh, and the Duke of York steps and the Duke of York column. So on the left-hand side, that's the mail. So that's where all the tripping the color, the Queen's birthday parade takes place. Um, and the uh, uh, royal weddings and royal funerals. Um, the, the, on the right-hand side there is the Duke of York column. Uh, the Duke of York column is, uh, well, the chap at the top there is the Duke of York, who was one of George III's sons uh, in the 1700s. Uh, the Duke of York is thought to be the inspiration for the grand old Duke of York, who had 10,000 men. He marched them up to the top of the hill and he marched them down again because he was a military leader, but he wasn't really good. But we're not here to talk about humans. No, we're here to talk about animals. And um, so just to the left of the Duke of York column, there's this big tree. Um, at the base of that tree is the grave of Giro, the German ambassador's dog. Uh, poor little Giro uh, went to doggy heaven in 1934 after an accident at the German embassy, which used to be right beside the tree. Uh, it's not any longer, but the, the German embassy used to be right beside the tree. That's moved. Uh, and the German ambassador actually had to ask for the king's permission to bury the dog here, um, because this is technically royal ground. Uh, and the king at the time, George V, uh, was a dog lover, so he said, absolutely, bury Giro, that's fine. Um, the, the German inscription, uh, sorry, the, the 
case was a bit grubby and there's a fence, so I couldn't clean it. Uh, it's Ein Truer Begleiter, uh, which I've had several German customers on my tours over the years and I've had several different translations. It seems to be a true companion or a, a, a true friend, man's best friend, uh, perhaps a German equivalent. Uh, Jiro, people like to, I've heard many people refer to him as the Nazi dog uh, of London. I mean, I didn't know Jiro personally, but I don't think he had any strong political beliefs uh, and his master didn't either. Um, his, his owner was um, not a supporter of the Nazi party. And I've often heard people say that Jiro was a German shepherd, just because that's so neat that he was the dog of the German ambassador. It would be great if he was a German shepherd, but he wasn't. There's Jiro with his owner. Um, uh, Jiro, the, the white dog there, uh, and his owner, uh, Leopold von Hosch, the German ambassador at their, at their home in the German embassy in London in happier times. So Jiro, definitely not a German shepherd. I, I can't quite make out what breed he is, but he's not a German shepherd. Uh, so let's carry on down the mall. We're going to keep going down the mall uh, at the bottom of the Duke of York steps there to Marlborough House and St. James's Palace. So this is Marlborough House. Uh, Marlborough House, which is now the home of the Commonwealth, the, um, the office rather, of the Commonwealth, which is kind of an international community. But it used to be uh, in the early 20th century, it was where dowager queens tended to be sent. Uh, if the king died, then the, his wife would be sent off to Marlborough House in the early part of the 20th century. Um, uh, it's where Queen Alexandra went to stay when her husband died. So Queen Alexandra was the wife of King Edward VII. Uh, when he died and his eldest son became king, uh, Alexandra lived here uh, with her many, many dogs. Queen Alexandra, big dog lover. Um, she generally had four or five dogs at any one time. And her husband, also a dog lover, King Edward VII, had a beloved dog called Caesar. And one of his last dying requests to his wife, Alexandra, was please look after Caesar. Um, she was the only one that he trusted to look after Caesar. And of course, Alex, yes, absolutely, uh, welcomed Caesar into her pack and they all came to live here at Marlborough House very happily until Caesar went to doggy heaven. There he is. He was buried in the grounds of Marlborough House. So when you're walking down the mouth, Caesar's grave, you can't see it. Um, it it's not open to the public usually. This was a special open day. Um, but it, it, Caesar's grave is there. Uh, and Caesar played a key pivotal role in the king's funeral. So when King Edward VII died, he requested um, that Caesar lead the funeral. And there he is. Um, so the, the, the king's horse, uh, this was not an actual request of Edward VII. This was, this was very common um, for there to be a riderless horse. Uh, sorry, I'm trying to remember the name of it. There's, there's, a, there's an actual name for the riderless horse, but I can't think of it. Uh, the, the, Throughout the 19th century and the early 20th century, it was kind of a thing in royal funerals and state funerals and military funerals. There was a riderless horse. It was what you did. The dog is much less common. So little Caesar here. Um, the king requested that he take the place of the chief mourner. So that's where Caesar is. Generally, this would have been um, the king or, or in this case, it should have been George V or possibly Queen Alexandra. But Edward uh, requested in his will that Caesar. Uh, take the place of the chief mourner and lead his funeral. Uh, so says something about how much he loved his little dog. Now let's carry on. Uh, just next door to Marlborough House is St. James's Palace. Uh, this is the Tudor part of St. James's Palace. So St. James's Palace originally built in the 1530s by King Henry VIII as a gift for his beloved wife Anne Boleyn. I mean, he chopped the head off, it didn't work out, but still. Uh, St. James's Palace, this is the Tudor uh, gatehouse and chapel here. Uh, we can see the lovely Tudor chimneys uh, on the roof there and uh, the guards. Those are not Tudor guards. Those are modern day guards, 21st century guards um, in their grey winter uniforms. Um, there, It's a very snowy day the day I took this picture. Uh, um, and some say, some historians believe um, that we still have these Tudor bits of the building um, because a dog saved St. James's Palace in 1809. That is not the dog. Uh, nobody even thought to get the dog's name or what breed it was in 1809. So this is my mother's childhood dog, Lassie. We're going to pretend she saved St. James's Palace in 1809. She looks like a good dog. She's ready to go. Look at her. Um, so in 1809, uh, in, in March at 2.30 in the morning, uh, a fire broke out in St. James's Palace. But sadly, nobody had noticed uh, when it broke out because it was in a part of the palace. In fact, the older part of the palace, the Tudor part of the palace, that wasn't used very much at the time. 
still isn't because it was drafty it's uncomfortable nobody lived there um, but if you've ever been inside a Tudor building uh, you'll know that there is a lot of wood there's wood paneling there's wood furniture there's wooden floors uh, so this fire that started got out of control very very quickly and still nobody had noticed and um, so our heroic dog Lassie let's say uh, decided that she had to do something and went off to find the guards. Uh, most dog lovers who know this story will come to the conclusion that Lassie probably lived at the palace. Um, or I mean, not Lassie, the dog that saved the palace, um, probably lived there because she's saving it and she knew to go to the guards. She knew exactly who to go to for help. So she went to the guards who would have been in roughly the same place as the modern day guards here are here. And she, she just created a fuss, barked at them, wouldn't leave them alone, lipping at their heels. Uh, just wouldn't leave the guards alone until finally the guards, oh, fine, we'll follow you then. Come on, Timmy's down the well. Uh, although Timmy wasn't down the well, it was a huge fight. So she led them to the fire and the guards raised the alarm and the fire was extinguished. Now, a lot of the palace was destroyed uh, in this fire, um, but we do still have, it was stopped in time for the Tudor Chapel and the gatehouse uh, to survive. And uh, many say that it's because of that little dog. If that dog uh, hadn't reacted and hadn't alerted the guards, then they might have ne never noticed until it was too late uh, and the palace would have been lost completely. So thank you, Lassie. You're a good girl. Well done. Uh, we're going to carry on down the mall right to the end of the mall to Buckingham Palace. There it is. Uh, Buckingham Palace is the home of the monarch. It's been the home of every monarch since the 1830s uh, and the royal family, the British royal family have historically been dog lovers. We, we've already heard about a few um, royals who have been uh, loved their dogs. And the dogs at Buckingham Palace would be walked in Buckingham Palace Gardens. This is actually a photo of Buckingham Palace Gardens taken by my mother when she broke in one day. No, I'm joking, when she was here on a tour. And so we would walk her corgis and her doggies. Um, this, this photo is a few years old, so these aren't the current dogs, um, but it's the same breed. She always has the same breeds of dog, the Pembrokeshire Corgi, which is the two, these two slightly pudgier dogs on the left. I don't know if that Corgi has actually knocked that man down. They are quite forthright creatures, apparently. The Corgis have got one again. Um, I'm sure they haven't. I think he's probably drying them off after a walk. Uh, the two dogs on the right there are doggies. Now, this is a breed of dog that the Queen invented. Uh, the Queen's late sister, Princess Margaret, always used to keep Dachshunds. Uh, the Queen has always kept Pembrokeshire Corgis. And two of the dogs got a little bit too friendly. And the litter of puppies that was born uh, were christened Dorgies, a cross between a Dachshund and a Corgi. Dorgies. Um, so these two dogs here are Dorgi. Dorgies. But the royal family, historically, um, for centuries back, have been dog lovers. Uh, here we've got King Charles II. Um, with an enormous dog. Um, so this is King Charles II as a boy before he became king with a, a, an enormous dog. Uh, just to the left there, that, that slightly terrifying looking baby is um, grew up to be King James II. Uh, Charles II died with no children. So both boys became, both brothers became king uh, and the two brothers are largely responsible for this breed, the King Charles Spaniel, as well as their father, King Charles I, who was also, they were a big dog lover family. Uh, King Charles I, the last thing he did before his execution in 1649 was walk his dog. So the last thing he did on, his, on this earth was walk his dog rogue. Uh, King Charles II, when he became king, uh, spent, th in one year, spent three pounds, 18 shillings and nine pence on cushions for his dogs. Which doesn't sound like a lot of money, but in the 1600s, that's the equivalent of about uh, 450 to 500 pounds. Um, so he, that, that's quite a lot of money for dogs' cushions. And King James II uh, did a very dog lover thing, a uh, dog owner thing. He was on a boat that was, um, what's the word, founder, about to sink. And his guards were trying to evacuate him um, off the ship. Uh, they were trying to get him off the ship. And he did a very dog owner thing, of not caring about himself, not caring about any other humans on the boat. All he cared about was the dogs. He was screaming, save the dogs, save the dogs. And he wouldn't get off the boat until someone went to get the dogs. Um, and everyone was fine. The dogs were fine, the humans were fine, even the ship was fine, it never did sink. And another royal dog lover there, we've got Queen Victoria as a princess. So this is her as a princess with them. Down in the bottom left-hand corner there is Dash, her childhood dog. Um, Queen Victoria 
had a, a rather strict upbringing. So before she was queen, um, she was living at Kensington Palace with her mother and very strict upbringing. Um, Victoria was uh, not allowed friends her own age. She couldn't have uh, any playmates around. Um, she uh, had, whenever she went up and down the stairs, she had to have someone hold her hand until she was 18 years old. And um, she wasn't really allowed out. Uh, she, she had to sleep in the same bed with her mother until she was 18. Uh, so as soon as she became 1837, uh, one of the first things she did was she and her dog Dash moved into Buckingham Palace away from her mother. And she said in later life that Dash was her only childhood friend. Well, that's kind of sad. Let's move on. Let's go to Green Park here. Green Park, which runs uh, up alongside Buckingham Palace Gardens, uh, is where they do gun salutes. So this is the King's Troop Royal Horse Artillery. Uh, who have gathered in Green Park ready for a gun salute. It's quite a sight to see. Uh, gun salutes are uh, carried out for royal birthdays and, and um, tripping the colour, the Queen's birthday, and for big events like state visits. If a, if a, a visiting uh, head of state comes, they, they'll do a gun salute for them. Uh, if uh, um, there's a, the Olympics, for example, um, the Jubilees, things like that, big national occasions. And this regiment is responsible um, for the gun salutes. In real life, the soldiers are an artillery regiment, largely a, a female regiment, actually. Uh, and when they do ceremonial things, they've got the horses with them. Very strong, very tough horses, because uh, they come in at quite a pace with those gun carriages. Um, this, this photo is blurred partly because I'm a terrible photographer, but partly because those horses, you can kind of tell those horses are moving quite fast uh, through the frame. So they come galloping in uh, with those heavy gun carriages. They, they stop, drop off the gun carriages, and then they gallop off um, to a safe distance while the humans do the firing of the cannons and the gun salute. Um, the horses are taken away to a safe distance while they do the gun salute. But I'm, I, I was chatting to one of the soldiers and they said they're, they're, they're pretty chilled about noise. Uh, just like the cavalry horses we met earlier on, they train them to be okay with noise. Apparently plastic bags still freaking out. A cannon going off, a plastic bag, oh no. Um, carrying on down to Hyde Park Corner here. Uh, Hyde Park Corner, almost solely so I can show you my favourite statue, or one of my favourite statues in London. This is uh, uh, on top of Wellington Arch. This is Peace in her quadriga. Uh, and the horses just have such energy. They just look like they're about to thunder off into the uh, uh, sky at any moment. Uh, and you can go right up to these, well, almost right up to them. You can go up to this balcony here. I mean, not right now because it's closed because of COVID, but uh, when you can, you can go up there. And equine experts and vets have said that the horses, when you get close to them, they're really um, detailed, really anatomically correct. Their muscles and tendons and veins or everything are all in the right place. And that's probably because the sculptor um, was a chap called Adrian Jones, was a World War I army veterinary surgeon. And um, so he knew horses. And he actually had a tea party inside the belly of one of the horses before he put it up there. I don't think you can do that with a real horse, fairly certain. Uh, and there's some real horses and the, and the statue of the horse up there, just to compare and contrast, real horse. Okay. Oh, sorry, that went on a bit quicker. Um, we're gonna move on anyway, uh, up to Mr. Bismarck's house. Um, this is my idea of a joke. It's not really Mr. Bismarck's house. I mean, Mr. Bismarck lived there on South Street, just off Park Lane, um, but really it's the home of Florence Nightingale. Um, her blue plaque there, possibly winning the prize for weirdest placed blue plaque in London. Florence Nightingale lived on South Street um, for much of her life. In fact, uh, for, for much of her adult life, Florence Nightingale was actually housebound or bedbound in, in, in extreme cases. Um, from almost not long after she got back from Crimea, she was struck by illness, um, which left her housebound and bedbound. For most of her adult life, so she did what any sane person would do, she got a lot of cats. Um, Florence Nightingale had over 60 cats uh, in her life, it, with uh, not all at once, but she would, she, uh, at times she had about a dozen uh, at any one time at her home on South Street. She was a big animal lover. Um, she also uh, loved an owl. Um, this is not one of Florence Nightingale's cats, by the way. This is. Uh, my friend's cat, Betty, who's gonna be standing in for Mr. Bismarck, who we'll get onto in a minute. Um, but on the left-hand side, I just wanna talk about that little blog down there. This is Florence Nightingale as a young woman. And that blog is an owl called Athena. Um, now Nightingale rescued Athena the owl when she was on holiday in Greece. 
um, some mean boys had knocked the owl out of its nest as a baby and were being a bit horrible. Um, so Nightingale shooed the boys away um, and rescued the owl. Um, she used to carry the little owl around with her in her pocket. Um, and apparently it was very protective. If anyone got too close to Florence Nightingale, it would pop out of her pocket and pet them. Um, so what it is to have a guard owl, eh? Uh, poor little Athena, uh, Nightingale went off to the Crimean War uh, to revolutionise nursing care, which is exactly what she did. Um, and didn't take Athena with her because that would have been silly, but Athena sadly died while Nightingale was away. Um, so when Nightingale got back from the Crimea, as we said, she became a cat lady. And uh, the reason I've included this part is it's, it's a lovely story to think of Nightingale surrounded by her cats uh, in her old age. Um, but very recently, I'm talking the last week or two, a letter has been made public um, where Nightingale is being very sweet about her cats uh, in this letter uh, about Mr. Bismarck in particular. Um, so it seems from Nightingale's kind of a cat owner who wouldn't say no to another cat, which is probably why we, she ended up with over 60, I think. Um, it, so in this letter, she explains um, that one of her friends had gone abroad. Um, and she had agreed to take Mr. Bismarck, but only temporarily. She was going to find Mr. Bismarck another home. So in this letter, she's writing to another friend, um, explaining this and kind of trying to sell Mr. Bismarck, basically. So she's being very sweet. She says, oh, Mr. Bismarck, he's this beautiful Persian cat um, who will follow you around like a dog and he's so dreadfully well behaved. Uh, he's got excellent manners. He'll only eat off the finest china plates. His, his favorite food is rice pudding, which Seems like an odd choice for a cat, but still. And she waxes lyrical about Mr. Bismarck in this very sweet way. Uh, I, I mean, this letter has made, been made public so recently that uh, historians are just kind of um, just now interpreting it. Uh, but there is, I have read one blogger who said that he's found another letter from years later where Nightingale mentions another cat called Mr. Bismarck. And it seems like a coincidence that she would have two cats of the same name. So we're assuming that never did find the home of Mr. Bismarck and just kept him. Um, so I've known a few cat owners like that who have just never said no to another cat. Oh, all right, I'll take him. Don't you worry. I've only got 12 others. So thank you, Betty, for pretending to be Mr. Bismarck. You did a lovely job there. Um, now we're going up to the, the last point on in Westminster. Uh, we're going to the Animals in War Memorial. Um, the Animals in War Memorial is in the middle of Park Lane uh, and it commemorates all military animals who were pressed into military service by Great Britain uh, uh, up until the 20th century, when we stopped using animals, in active service anyway. So you can see here that the, uh, the, the horse and the mule and the donkey rather are, are on one side of the wall are laden down with the paraphernalia of war and then as they go through the gap in the wall the horse and dog are released of their burdens. The dog here, uh, the horse rather, uh, is based on a horse called Goliath, who was uh, not only the largest horse uh, to ever serve with the British Army in the First World War, he was also one of the last horses uh, to ever go to the front line. In fact, one of the last creatures to ever go to the front line. Uh, one of the last horses, certainly. Uh, and on the, on the uh, wall there, you can see the, the silhouettes of other animals uh, carved into the wall. So the camel and the elephant, which were used as cargo animals, the pigeons, which were used uh, as messengers uh, to carry messengers, messages. Uh, they also had glowworms in the trenches of World War I. Uh, cats were used as mousers on Navy ships. And um, so all these animals are commemorated uh, at the Animals in War Memorial. Now I want to talk about one animal uh, who received a medal uh, in the Second World War but it's not near here and something that's only possible in a virtual tour, we're gonna to fast travel from there on Park Lane up to the city of London, to St. Paul's Cathedral. Uh, so this is St. Paul's Cathedral, which is a glorious building, one of my favorite buildings in the world. Um, I'm not gonna talk about that though. I want to talk about this church just in front of it, that's St. Augustine's. Uh, St. Augustine's during the Second World War had a church cat um, called Faith. Um, I, this is a London thing. I, I, I'm, I'm not even sure whether this is a national or international thing, um, but churches tend to have cats which are used as mousers. Even currently churches do tend to have cats, uh, church cats, uh, who keep them, same reason Navy ships and government buildings do keep the mice population down. 
Um, in the Second World War, the church cat at St. Augustine's was called Faith. There she is. Um, Faith, during the Second World War, in fact, during the Blitz, Faith had a kitten called Panda. And on one night, one day, Faith decided that she and Panda were going to go and live in the crypt. She made herself a little nest in the crypt, she and Panda. Uh, and it didn't matter how many times the verger tried to get the, church, the cat up to the nice warm vestry where there was a fire and cushions and things. No, nope, Faith wasn't having it. She and Panda were going to go and live in the crypt. Two days after she made that decision, uh, a bomb hit the church and completely destroyed it. The only bits to survive were the spire and underneath the spire, which we can see today, underneath the spire, the corner of the crypt where Faith and Panda were found safe and well um, by rescuers digging through the rubble. Little Faith had apparently a moment of weird animal sixth sense uh, and saved her life and the life of her kitten panda. For that, she was rewarded with the Maria Dickin Medal of Honor. That's the medal there. Um, the Maria Dickin uh, Medal of Honor was awarded to wartime animals, not just cats, um, uh, dogs who found uh, people in the rubble uh, during the Blitz and pigeons and uh, uh, all sorts of animals received the Maria Dickin Medal of Honor. And she was remembered. She became famous worldwide. Um, this report here is from the New York Times uh, reporting Faith's death in 1948, so years later. So dear little Faith, the hero cat of the Blitz. And that's it, that's the end of my tour. Thank you very much. I hope you're not bored like Gypsy up in the corner here. Um, that's, uh, she's not a famous dog. She's, uh, she was my childhood dog, um, but she did come from Battersea Dogs and Cats Home. Uh, so this tour is free. Normally at this point in a real life tour, I would be making some sort of a subtle quest for a tip. And my virtual tip jar is down there if you'd like to virtually buy me a cup of tea. Uh, but I would much prefer it if you went onto my Just Giving page there uh, and gave a few pennies to Battersea Dogs and Cats Home instead by the, uh, the dogs and cats a, a, a bit a tin of whiskers or something instead. And if you'd like to join me, uh, my next tour will be on Thursday the 15th of April, uh, talking about P.G. Woodhouse and Bertie Wooster uh, in London. Uh, thanks for joining me. I'll, I'll hang on for uh, a moment if uh, anyone would like to ask questions. <laughs>